Bom dia a todas, a todos. Eu tenho a alegria de dar boas-vindas a vocês é, para esse evento de hoje, que dá início à construção de um projeto, do projeto acadêmico de reescrita de decisões judiciais em perspectiva feminista no Brasil. O projeto é inspirado nas iniciativas realizadas em diversos outros países e parte da seguinte pergunta. Que tipo de efeitos teríamos se o sistema de justiça utilizasse abordagens e perspectivas feministas e antirracistas no processo de tomada de decisões judiciais? No Brasil, o judiciário e outras carreiras jurídicas, incluindo a carreira acadêmica, ainda são compostas majoritariamente por homens, brancos, oriundos de classe média alta. E apesar do impacto importante de diversas correntes críticas do direito na formação jurídica brasileira, nas três últimas décadas, as abordagens feministas e antirracistas ainda são marginais nos currículos de graduação e de pós-graduação e no fazer jurisdicional. Nosso projeto envolve uma rede colaborativa com acadêmicas, estudantes e ativistas em direitos humanos de diversas regiões do país e se propõe a reescrever um conjunto de decisões judiciais proferidas por tribunais brasileiros que tiveram sérias implicações na realização de justiça para as mulheres e grupos marginalizados no Brasil. Até o momento, além da FDRP, da USP, temos 39 professoras envolvidas no projeto das seguintes instituições, a Faculdade de Direito da USP, a Unifesp, a Unesp, o NB, o FPA, o ESP, o FPB, Mackenzie, FGV, Uniriter, FURG, UNEB, é, Estadual do Mato Grosso do Sul, o FPI, o FBA, PUC Rio de Janeiro, PUC São Paulo, o FRJ, o FRR, o FPR, Unirio, Uniceub e a Federal, o FRPE, o AST. É um exercício de imaginação sociopolítica voltado a acelerar a incorporação das abordagens feministas e antirracistas no pensamento jurídico brasileiro e no fazer cotidiano de profissionais do direito. Em uma segunda fase, o projeto é também uma proposta que visa oferecer ferramentas e repertório para o ativismo em direitos humanos no país. E temos pressa. Esse evento, ele acontece em uma semana difícil para a história da democracia no país. Estamos sufocadas pela fumaça que sobe das ruínas de nossas instituições democráticas e também das queimadas florestais que têm se agravado a cada ano no país. Mas também, esse evento ocorre no mesmo dia e hora em que está começando a Marcha das Mulheres Indígenas, em Brasília, na defesa da existência dos povos indígenas e da Mãe Terra. Esperamos que esse evento possa ser uma forma simbólica de estarmos alinhadas com elas. Gostaria de agradecer muito ao Instituto de Estudos Avançados, Polo Ribeirão Preto, às 790, 790 pessoas que se inscreveram até agora no evento e que nos assistem pelo YouTube. A querida Ana Laura de Azevedo Oliveira, que faz a tradução simultânea deste evento, é, e aos professores Caio, Flávia Trentini e colegas da FDRP que estão na organização do projeto comigo na FDRP. Também agradecer as integrantes do nosso grupo de pesquisa Direito, Democracia e Desigualdades da FDRP, a partir da Júlia e da Élida, que estão aqui conosco e vão colaborar na condução dessa mesa e no desenvolvimento do projeto também. Hoje temos a satisfação de contar com a presença de três acadêmicas que são inspirações para todas as pessoas no mundo que são interessadas no estudo sobre direito, gênero e feminismo. Elas não, são, elas não apenas desenvolveram projetos do mesmo tipo em seus países, como têm dado suporte para que o projeto possa acontecer em outras regiões. Elas aceitaram imediatamente nosso convite para conversar conosco sobre suas experiências e esperamos que a partir de hoje elas possam ser nossas parceiras de diálogo para o desenvolvimento do projeto aqui no Brasil. Que tenhamos um bom encontro hoje e amanhã. Obrigada. Então, bom dia. A gente inicia a tradução simultânea agora. É, Ana, trocar por português. Sim, ok. É, bom dia, gente. A partir de agora, Good nós, vamos, nós vamos entrar. We're about to start. Our event officially, and it's important to mention that this event uh, comes with a good example of feminist friendship, and especially according to Erika, Erika, Rosemary, and Julie. We're thankful for uh, your availability to stay here and 
to share with us your experience. So, we thank you for, uh, yes, uh, the International Solidarity and, oh my God, just a second. <laughs> Okay, so Erica will be first, then it's going to go Jol Julie, and then Rosemary. Erica Rackley. So Erica, we thank you for your presence here, and Julie. She's introducing you, that's why I'm not repeating. Thanks, Julie, for your presence. And Rosemary Hunter. E apoiou o projeto semelhante nos Estados Unidos, Irlanda, Irlanda do Norte, Índia, Escócia e no direito internacional, bem como um projeto semelhante focado em direitos das crianças. É uma honra para a gente ter. It's an honor to have you all here. <laughs> so, Erika, you can start. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to um, share my. Green, I hope. If I do that, can you see my PowerPoints? Can somebody just nod? Excellent, thank you. So um, I want to say thank you so much for um, the invitation and being able to um, talk to you. The brilliant thing about going first in um, is that Julie and Rosemary will pick up on things that I've said and correct me and I can uh, kick us off, um, but we've split the um, session so that I'm going to start talking to you about what we did with the English and Welsh project. Um, Julie will then talk about the project she was involved in the Northern Irish project and Rosemary will pick up with other projects that she's been involved and kind of draw the um, presentation together. So I'm going to concentrate on the, the UK or the England English and Welsh project and and this was us I hunted out this um, photo we were inspired by the Canadian um, women's court which was a group of feminist academics who had rewritten um, a section a number of section 15 cases from the Canadian Supreme Court and we picked up this idea and asked these questions. These were the questions that we had, that what if a feminist group of feminist scholars were to write the missing judgments in key cases? Could they put feminist theory into practice? And if so, it will, how would this work? What would the judgments look like? And importantly, um, what impact would they have? And so we started in our first meeting. Um, that's uh, taken... Oh, so can, can you go a little bit slower, yeah, please? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Can you repeat Thank the you questions? <laughs> I got um, kind of lost here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Thank sorry. You. Um, so we asked, what, what if a group of feminist scholars were to write missing judgments in key cases? So what, what if we did that? What would they look like? Could we put feminist theory into practice? And importantly, what impact would they have? So we met in the uh, rooms of Durham Castle um, and got together and worked out kind of what our pro project might look like. The key motivation was to try and demonstrate how the insights of feminist theory could be applied and used in judgment um, form. And what we were motivated by and these were the sort of motivations of a number of the projects was to sort of be able to demonstrate the impact of feminist jurisprudence the impact feminist jurisprudence could have on judicial decision making not just as a form of critique but within the judicial process and we also wanted to offer a real life demonstration as to what difference it might make if these and other perspectives were included on the bench 
how, what difference it might have to the way in which cases were um, the outcome of cases, but also the reasoning of um, of cases. And so we were, in the end, a group of around 50, a mixture of academics and activists and members of the um, legal profession. We uh, were a fair mix across the, the feminist legal um, community in, in the UK um, and across a number of sort of disciplines um, within law. And together, we developed a sort of what might loosely be considered our, our rules um, in terms of what we, um, what we were wanting to do. And so these our rules were that we, the cases um, that chosen needed to be in some way significant for, for feminist legal scholarship, that we wanted cases that were going to be able to be used and to demonstrate um, how the insights of feminist legal theory we quite quickly um, decided that um, they should be cases that had been decided in the case in the courts of England and Wales. From the beginning of our project, we had inquiries from people talking about writing about cases in other jurisdictions. And um, we quite quickly realized that what we needed to do if we were going to make our, our project coherent and to work was to kind of restrain ourselves within a particular within a particular jurisdiction. We also decided that we would only use sources that were publicly available at the time of the decision. So what this meant was we wanted to be able to demonstrate that these were judgments that could have been written and decided at the time the cases were being decided. And um, one of our cases went back to 1925. So we went back to 1925, used the, the sources that were there to, to in order to see how those cases could have been decided. What was also important here is that we didn't hear new evidence. We weren't part of um, how other projects have worked where they have heard new evidence in particular um, cases or bodies of cases. We weren't hearing new evidence. We were, we were using the, um, the evidence that was available. We needed to observe the precedents that were there at the time at which the case was being written. So we couldn't use later cases in order to support our, the points we were making. And importantly, they needed to read and sound and look like judgments. So this was, we had a number of discussions at the, throughout our, our project about rethinking what judgments might look like and what judgments could be. Um, but what we did was that we adopted the style and the formatting of judgments um, to make sure to kind of which goes to our um, aim, which was to make the project as, as um, realistic as as possible. And so we followed the conventions of the courts we were we were looking at. And this was us. We we met um, and I uh, had hunted out these photos. These were us. We had a series of um, workshops. It was over a course of about 18 um, months. And we basically did a lot of the things that judges do. It was important that we, in the, in the English and Welsh system, that judges do collaborate. They do talk about um, their, their, their judgments. And we did that too. So everyone came to the workshops where judgments were presented and debated and challenged. Um, there was also obviously um, detailed written, um, written uh, comments as well, but this process was a collaborative process. And so what I wanted to um, draw attention here is that this was simply part of the project was also about building a network and community of feminist activism and, and academics. And so we were wanting to create a space where discussions could be had about the judgments, um, but also leading on to, to other things. And so we produced our book. Um, I now, uh, on our book, that's the cover of our book. And our book had two each, the, our discussions were presented in two ways. So what we decided to do was that each judgment was written 
from scratch and was written as a judgment. Although unlike um, judges in real life, we applied a word limit on our um, academic judgment writers, which meant that sometimes they concentrated on, had to concentrate on um, single or, or fewer, fewer issues. But we presented the judgment and the judgment stood alone. So the judgment is there on, on its own, but we included prior to the judgment, what we you called was a commentary. The purpose of the commentary being to explain the background to the judgment, but also how the feminist judgment differed to the um, to the real life real life judgment to to give an introduction. And this was really important to us because we wanted the judgments to be accessible to people who were able to read them and particularly to to students, but for them to be able to see what we were doing differently. And and as an aside, when I've used these judgments in my teaching, you, you, we might think it's really obvious that the feminist judgment is, a, is different because we know the judgment that we're critiquing and rewriting. But if you don't know, some of our judgments are, are so persuasive that students can't always tell. Which is which is the different which is the different judgment and um, and that was that was important to us and so we adopted as far as we could the sort of the formatting and the style and the presentation of the judgments over the spectrum of, of the years that we we looked at and so this is our our collection and I'm kind of you know part of what I'm doing here is to give you an overview of like there was about the project is partly about process. So it's partly about how we did the project and how we chose to do the project and how um, Rosemary and um, Julie will talk about how other projects were, were different, did things differently and the impact and importance of how those projects had done things differently. So part of it's about process and then part of it's about substance. And so we had a collection in the end of 23 judgments. Most of the judgments are what you might call shadow judgments or additional judgments in a the case. So they sorry, are, can you repeat that part about the yeah. judges, please? <laughs> so most of the judgments that we wrote were written as additional judgments to the original case. So in England and Wales, there may be a number of judgments in a particular case, some of which are concurrences which are judgments where they agree with the ultimate decision, but might, might reach that decision for different reasons, or they might be dissenting judgments where they disagree in terms of the outcome of the case. And so we're quite used, particularly in, our, um, in the House of Lords and the Supreme Court, for having multiple judgments in a particular case. And we were simply adding in an extra, an extra judgment. It might be a concurrence, it might be a dissent. And what we found was that sometimes because of the way in which the, um, the information that was available and the rules we'd set ourselves around precedent, it might, in some cases, it was that the feminist judge was unable to come to a different decision, but was able to write a feminist judgment make, using arguments and reasoning that supported um, that kind of supported a diff supported the outcome in a different in a different way, or it was important that it was done. At other times, of course, it was a dissent where they disagreed with the um, they disagreed with the decision overall. In a few cases, um, our colleague, uh, our judgment writers imagined that the case had been appealed. Um, and they said, what might the appeal look like here? What might the judgment in the appeal um, be? Be So we allowed relative flexibility in terms of whether um, people wanted to kind of add an additional judgment or do a, a fictional appeal, but they were all appellate decisions. And that goes to our point about not looking at evidence and new and, and, and hearing new evidence. As I've said, we had a whole spectrum. We went back to 1925 and we covered a whole um, area of um, many areas of law. I've listed them there. Um, so, you know, things, obvious ones that you might expect around family law and discrimination and um, medical law and so on, but also um, perhaps less obviously feminist um, topics um, coming out of administrative law or constitutional law um, and, and so on. Each of our judgments 
followed the kind of the components of a judgment. So it, it had it had the the, the judgments um, there. This was this is like what we looked at in terms of what a English and Welsh judgment or UK judgment looks like. And obviously there's jurisdictional variations, but we were keen that we as academics followed the format of a judgment and we wrote them as if they were a judgment. It is a judgment. It was unsurprising, although still um, something that many academic judgment writers found it quite hard to be a judge and to come to a decision and to resolve the case and to provide a remedy. As academics, we were used to sort of arguing one side and the other and, and leaving it in, in the balance as opposed to like making a decision. And so part of what we were doing was encouraging um, our colleagues to, to make that um, decision. So form, so we had the sort of the process of how we did, did the judgments was, in, was important to us. The substance of what we looked at um, was, excuse me, was important to, to us. Um, and then also the form, the sort of the, the method that we were, we were using. Um, we had, I, I hadn't looked at this for a while until I was prepping for um, this, um, I'm so sorry, this is this presentation. This was what we wrote in our um, introduction um, at the time where we we said that we, we hoped that the project of judgment writing um, will be taken up by other feminists and other, uh, by feminists and other critical scholars as a new method of legal critique and that it will be developed substantively, theoretically and methodologically um, from the beginnings that we have offered and in ways that might be an influence upon the practice of judging. Um, and looking back at that now, it seems either that we were like being really big headed and we actually thought it might happen and we're now, or um, it's like we were, we were really, really, really hopeful. And, and part of our conversation that we're having today is, is the way in which the feminist judgment process has gone and been developed. And you're gonna hear about the other projects and how the projects have all been uh, had similarities and difference to ours and how feminist judgment writing really has been um, adopted um, the kind of methodology of feminist judgment, judgment writing has been adopted and used and challenged and progressed um, by other by other scholars and so what we've got and this is the impact of feminist judgment projects well all the feminist judgment projects rather than the English and Welsh one specifically, is that we have had this influence on other projects, on academics, writing and the way in which people um, think about and are able to articulate um, the impact of feminist legal scholarship, then had a sort of other impact which we weren't necessarily expecting, but something that has been exploited by other projects around the impact upon students and how we teach and what um, how we might encourage and 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 um, educate um, the students that we work with um, in relation to particular um, particular topics impact upon judicial arguments for judicial diversity that we have demonstrated and we have been used in, uh, around um, why it is important that there is a diverse bench and what difference that might make We've seen the feminist judgments being used by judges in order to kind of um, the arguments or the thinking of the feminist judgments being used by judges in, in their thinking, certainly um, in their extra um, judicial writings, like understanding and thinking about how it is they're approaching their decision making. And also upon like feminist activists and activism in terms of how those judgments have been used, which are all reasons for, um, for how we might uh, how we might approach and reasons why we might do the project. So that's where I wanted to finish and I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Julie. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Sorry. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so good morning everyone and thanks very much um, for inviting me here today to speak about the Northern Irish Feminist Judgments Project. It's a real pleasure. So the image here on my title slide um, and indeed my next slide is the book that we published from our project towards the end of 2016 and I hope you like the cover. So it's a photo by Irish photographer Rose Comiskey from her exhibition Against the Tide. This exhibition chronicled protests about women's reproductive rights in Ireland in the 1980s and early 1990s. We selected this image to capture many things about the project, not least of which was the playfulness with which our feminist judges, commentators and wider group of participants approached the task of remodelling judgment. The photograph can be seen as representing our efforts to embody the judicial role in a way that connects with the wider politics of female dissent and contestation. When we started our project, feminist judging had gained significant credibility um, as a critical socio-legal method, following, of course, the English project that Erica has just spoken about, and the Australian project was also well underway. We wanted to develop the methodology in ways that spoke to the particularities of the Northern Irish experience. So in thinking about the question on my slide, why do a feminist judgments project? The obvious answer is to rewrite judgments. But I think that in doing so, all the feminist judgments projects have asked further questions, whether in relation to critical evaluations of national political contexts, uh, the operation of the judiciary, judgment writing, and other legal institutions and fora. So in answering this question, I think it's good to be conscious of the story or stories that you want to tell, not just in each rewritten judgment, but in your project as a whole. What interventions do you want to make legally, politically, and also in terms of education? As part of the particular methodology of the Northern Irish Feminist Judgments Project, we incorporated contributions from a wide range of cross-disciplinary perspectives in order to engage with non-legal modes of judging, crafting texts, and deciphering Northern Irish national identity. And I'll talk a bit more about the identity dimension of the project shortly. But one particularly important engagement was with um, political poets, visual and performance artists, whose work embodied the nexus between art, activism, feminism and protest. And this brings me back to the image on the book cover of a feminist protester jumping out under a giant paper mache judicial puppet. We thought that this wonderful photograph nicely captured this nexus and spoke to the focus of our project on the role of judging in the construction of collective and national political identities. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how the Brazilian Feminist Judgments Project will further develop the methodology, particularly in relation to its anti-racist focus, and what particularities of the Brazilian experience and Brazilian feminism we will learn about. This, of course, is not to say that you need to do your project in jurisdictional isolation. And a project that came um, a number of years after ours, and which speaks well to our engagement with artists, was the more recent Scottish Judgments Project. In their project methodology, one important dimension was to explore whether art and artistic strategies might trouble law's claim to close itself off from other discourses and practices in order to conceal its own incoherence and contingency. Could judgments be co-produced with artists or be marked by artistic engagements in order to bring in knowledge, subjectivities and non-textual experience that is often excluded by law? The project co-directors reported this was in fact quite difficult to do and concluded that while art can speak about law, it may not be able to speak to law. That having to reproduce something incredible 
realistic legal language and form means it is difficult to make space for that alternative speaking. I'm not going to say any more about the Scottish Feminist Judgments Project, and I know that Rosemary will be talking about the projects more widely in her presentation. Um, but there is a, a link on the slide to their website if you're interested. A further reason to do a feminist judgment project, and Erica spoke about this, is that it can be a highly generative experience in both academic and personal terms. So for example, I had the opportunity to work with Irish feminist scholars that I would not otherwise really have had a working relationship with, either because we have quite substantive um, differing legal interests or because of our geographical spread. The project also transformed my approach to academic work. And I don't think I was alone in this, particularly in relation to how I write, on interdisciplinary perspectives on law and rethinking my feminist practice and what that means. There is the opportunity through a feminist judgments project to create and sustain an important network a network that can support each other to create new legal knowledge and imagine alternative futures. And in many ways, collaboration is at the heart of the feminist judging methodology. So while me, Maria Enright and Aoife O'Donoghue may have directed the Northern Irish project, it was a collaborative team effort. As mentioned, we involved not just legal academics, but academics from a wide range of disciplines art, architecture, politics, sociology, history, geography, midwifery, to help us decipher the national identity dimension of the project. Activists, artists and poets prompted us to see judgments and craft texts in different ways, while the personal experience of some of the litigants from our cases helped us incorporate that all important experiential dimension as well as consideration of litigation as feminist strategy. These academic activists and artistic contributions also rendered our project with an intergenerational dimension. And that was important in the national context of a significant Irish diaspora. Many project participants were based in Britain, not Ireland or Northern Ireland. So for example, I haven't lived in Northern Ireland in well over a decade. While social media can connect us all, there is an incommensurability of lived experience that can be challenging. We also involved legal practitioners and a small number of judges who were highly supportive of the project. Others, however, were clearly quite wary of being seen to associate with the feminists. Um, and we find it difficult to gain the support of, for example, any women's lawyers or professional associations. And I wonder what your experience will be in Brazil, particularly in light of recent political attacks um, on the judiciary. So why did we involve all these people? In short, we wanted to try and enlarge our mentality around judgment and to locate our project in the context of wider feminist struggles around law and judicial identity projects. And on this slide are members of one of the activist groups, speaking of Imelda. They're a group of Irish women based in London who have long campaigned for abortion access in Ireland. And in this photo, they're talking about their Knickers for Choice campaign in the lead up to the referendum on whether the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, which gave fetal life the same constitutional protection as pregnant women should be repealed. Since our project, it has been repealed. So while feminist judgments projects work within legal institutions, modes and conventions, their purpose is to ask and indeed show how feminist knowledge, dissent and contestation might be translated into the language of official legality. In doing this, feminist judges are asking, what can we introduce into the discourse of law and how can we make law listen or at least take heed of feminist concerns? Sometimes we will find ways of doing that, sometimes we cannot. And judgment projects can usefully make room for that kind of reflection.
And this leads me to my final offering of why to do a feminist judgments project. It can create an important feminist space, legal and otherwise. Our project started in 2014, and we were very conscious of a series of upcoming centenary years. 2016 would be the anniversary of the Easter Rising and the proclamation of the Irish Republic. Well, 2021 would mark 100 years since Ireland was partitioned by the UK government, or the British government rather, with what was termed Southern Ireland leaving the UK later in 1921, becoming the Irish Free State, now officially known just as Ireland. We anticipated male dominated celebrations of these events with women's role in the political history of Ireland typically sidelined and perhaps silenced. We wanted to have a space and produce a text that would contribute to other upcoming academic work on women's role in the history of Ireland and Northern Ireland, as well as artistic work that connected Irish history and mythology to prefigurative political and cultural futures. In some ways, this was also a space for us to bring feminist theory, activism and protest to law and judgment to otherwise conservative societal institutions. So for example, could we incorporate public opinion polls on the acceptability of abortion into the texts of rewritten judgments? What about the history of women's marching and parading in terms of determining what cross community should mean for public representation on the Parades Commission? As well as the texts of rewritten judgment, our book further includes an introductory chapter on women's legal history in Ireland and Northern Ireland, as well as a judicial role in collective national identity projects. And these were important chapters for our book. We're all familiar with critiques of law's claimed neutrality and the supposed desirability of neutral, faceless judges. But there are other ways of looking at the role of the judge and judgment ways that show judges to be nakedly political figures in a society, even as they operate in the context of an agreed set of criteria and conventions, at least as amongst the legal community. But judgments, especially those of the appellate courts, are texts on the public record. They say something about what a country is supposed to stand for, what its laws and rules are meant to be. Delivering a judgment is an act with public consequences for the individual litigants, but also in terms of an evaluation and weighing up of determinative factors and in shaping, opening or restricting debate on a particular issue. In the introductory chapters of our book, we set out and respond to two of the key underpinning research questions for our project. And to have chapters in our book that would hopefully encourage other scholars and students to think about the judicial role in this way. These questions were, what are the relationships between judging, national identities and the political lives of Northern Irish women? And how can the judicial role be critically reimagined in contexts of transition from ethno-national conflict, colonialism and religious patriarchy? In asking these questions across two jurisdictions with separate legal systems, so Ireland and Northern Ireland, we wanted to think about judges as explicitly political figures in conflict-ridden societies and how they have delineated the political lives and boundaries of women and other marginalised persons, as much as politicians, security forces, paramilitaries and community and religious leaders. And when we were trying to work through this framing of the project, we had a number of other jurisdictions across the world in mind, also marked by colonialism, but different from the settler colonialism of countries like Canada, Australia and New Zealand. They may have been marked by partition and religious ethno-national conflict and a vague hope that the methodology that we developed in our project may speak to other countries and parts of the world um, in a relatable way. Africa is the next cross-jurisdictional project. There may be others that I um, 
haven't haven't don't know about. Other projects have embarked in partitioned states, such as India, Pakistan, and Turkey, with all the countries indicated here to include Brazil having a history of colonization, some with violent and ongoing conflict, others grappling with significant questions around the treatment of indigenous and other marginalized groups. I think it's really exciting to imagine what we'll learn from all these emerging feminist judgments projects, some of which, all of which, will take the methodology to very different legal systems, um, such as civil law and mixed common and civil law systems. And this brings me to Margaret Davies critical evaluation of feminist judgments projects and that their power lies in the collaborative dimension of the methodology and collective action. Given that law will never be changed by single reform or acts alone, but only collective irritants. That we are here today speaking, I think, with over 300, maybe more Brazilian feminist scholars is really incredible. And I like to use this image from an alternative Miss Ulster pageant in Northern Ireland to represent how through feminist judging, Feminist legal scholars across the world are increasingly in conversation with one another, as well as feminist activists, artists, practitioners, and scholars from other disciplines. But coming back to the judges' troubles and the gendered politics of identity aspects of our project, as well as our explicit introductory chapters, the other way that we developed this dimension was to organize our rewritten cases by a typology of four political subjects, the foreign subject, mothering subject, the choosing and the embodied subject. We did, of course, have a table in our introduction, organizing cases by the more um, traditional substantive issues and categories, family law, criminal law, discrimination law, etc. And I'd like to conclude today, not by talking about the particular feminist theories and techniques used by our feminist judges. Okay, so whether that is um, bringing in feminist knowledges, feminist research, uh, asking the woman question, making certain things visible, but by speaking briefly to what our participants use feminist theory and techniques to do in their rewritten judgments in terms of one of the political identities from our typology, so the mothering subject. And there were four key ways that our judges reconstructed the mothering subject. First, they made room for different political identities for women in their judgments, normalizing things like abortion and mothering outside of the marital relationship. Second, they address the power question in terms of state responsibility and harm across areas such as welfare and social security payments to mothers, to the value of privacy to women, as opposed to privacy of the family unit, and to the state's role in historic institutional abuse. Third, the rewritten judgments challenged the truth that motherhood is incompatible with other identities, particularly those in the public domain. And finally, they used the space of the judgments to challenge challenged motherhood, from protesting mothers uh, to unmarried mothers to immigrant mothers. Okay, so I hope to have raised your interest in the Northern Ireland Feminist Judgments Project and perhaps identified some potential synergies um, with your own Brazilian project. But overall, I hope you're feeling excited about the potential of your project and the possibilities of what might be achieved. So thank you for listening and I look forward to future discussion. Thank you, Julie. I think now we uh, listen to Rosemary. Please, Rosemary, the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for um, inviting us to speak at your workshop. 
um, Erica and Julie have very nicely set up my presentation. Um, so I'll just attempt to share my screen and I'll talk about feminist judgment projects around the world. Uh, and I just changed my view. Right, okay. Um, so what I'm going to focus on in this uh, discussion is the, the sort of theoretical framing of the different projects. And the, the Julie's talked um, in particular about the, the theoretical approach um, that was taken within the Northern Irish project. And so I, what I want to do is give you a sense of how other projects have thought about themselves as a project, what is the story that they're trying to tell, and also give you some idea about the kind of range of resources that are available to you as you're um, going through and um, you know, developing your own project. So Erica mentioned that the, the first uh, Feminist Judgments project was um, done by a group who called themselves the Women's mm -hmm. Court of Canada. Uh, and so they, they really established themselves as a separate court, um, which is different from what has happened in the subsequent projects. Um, but they, they, were, they set themselves up as a court that was reviewing decisions, so fictionally reviewing decisions of the Canadian Supreme Court. And, and what, it was, what they were particularly focused on was the Canadian Supreme Court's equality jurisprudence. So in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there's a guarantee of equality before and under the law. Um, and many of the members of the Women's Court project had been part of a lobbying organisation and an organisation that had made a number of interventions in Supreme Court cases dealing with the concept of equality. And they felt that this, the court had stopped listening to them. So the court had been attentive to their arguments to begin with, but then had and moved on or felt that, you know, that gender issues had been dealt with. Clearly they hadn't, but they were searching for another way of capturing the attention of the court. And they came up with the idea of, rather than simply making submissions to the court, that they would show the court how they thought it should have divided, decided um, these particular cases. And so they started out with, with only a small number of cases, with six cases focused on um, the, the concept of equality and arguing about how the court should be interpreting that concept, both in substantive terms and in intersectional terms um, and in terms that, uh, that the court had, had been failing to do. Then um, uh, moving on to the two projects that you've just heard about. So the, we took a similar methodology in the English project, but expanded it out to include the whole of English law. Um, and we asked people to think about which judgments they might like to rewrite from across that very broad range. And our focus, as Erica mentioned, was this issue of, of putting theory into practice, of showing how feminist theory could be translated into a judgment and of course, that involved overcoming the notion that feminism and judging were incompatible, um, the notion that there was no place for feminism in a judgment because law is objective and therefore any kind of a feminist judgment must necessarily be biased and therefore illegitimate. And so our aim was to show the ways in which feminist Theory and sorry. consciousness. Uh, Rosemary, hi. Yes. <laughs> sorry, can you please repeat the last part? Yeah. I got a little bit lost. <laughs> That's okay. So, our aim was to show, to demonstrate that feminism and judging are not incompatible. Um, that a feminist judgment is not 
necessarily is not at all a biased judgment, which is what many people assume, but instead is a judgment that corrects bias, is a judgment that overcomes the existing bias in law towards men's experience, men's interests, um, and men's domination of the judiciary. Um, and so that was that was our you know, sort of key aim. And Julie's talked about um, the the connection in the Northern Irish project um, with the issue of national identity and the judicial construction of national identity and the the uh, concern to produce a more expansive um, construction of national identity, which included a place for women as active subjects as choosing, mothering, um, and uh, autonomous subjects rather than as subordinate, as operating within a very narrow um, domestic sphere. The Australian project um, ha had two, I suppose, theoretical strands. The larger one was about exploring the impact of feminist jurisprudence on Australian law. And so as well as rewriting a series of judgments, that project also engaged in research, looking at and thinking about how feminism had influenced Australian law. So that included undertaking a number of interviews with Australian judges who identified as feminists um, and who talked to us in their interviews about how they engaged in their judicial practice as feminists. Um, and I've written up some of that material and some of my other collaborators in that project have written um, about the results of those interviews. Um, but we also did uh, looked at some specific areas of law um, around sexual harassment, um, uh, provocation, uh, the, when uh, women kill abusive partners um, and the development of self-defence and provocation defences for those women. Um, uh, we looked at pay equity and, um, and the issue of what's sometimes called sexually transmitted sex, so the ways in which um, women are assumed to be um, agreeing to uh, charges by banks on their husband's, um, on their family home uh, for the, in the interest of their husband's business. So we looked at those four areas and looked at the ways that feminist jurisprudence had been um, influential in changing the law in those particular areas in practice. And then in terms of writing um, our alternative judgments, one of, the, one of the key themes in the Australian project was um, the issue about the, the possibilities for writing from the position of Indigenous women in a context where um, Indigenous sovereignty has been denied and, and suppressed um, throughout the settler um, colonial history of Australia. And so the Indigenous women who were participating in the project um, felt that they couldn't um, couldn't simply write from a position of a regular judge within the, uh, the white Australian legal system. Um, and some of them, uh, but they took different views. So there was, there was one participant who said, I, I, I can only write from a position of alternative sovereignty and therefore I can't write a judgment. I can only write about my... Um, my knowledge, the knowledge that comes to me from my relationship with the land. Rather Sorry, than Rosemary, I got lost in that last part. Can you please go there again? <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, so this is a, an Indigenous woman who argued that she could only write from the position of a, a, a sovereign position, which meant that she had to write from from the position of standing on and deriving her knowledge from her own land rather than being authorised by the, the invaded legal system. Um, 
another participant um, did write a regular judgment but did it um, imagining that she was being asked uh, to sit on the court as a specialist in Indigenous law. And it was a, it was a question about um, uh, consumer protection in Indigenous communities. And so we, we sort of made a fiction about the fact that the court was seeking specific Indigenous input in understanding the facts of that case. And she, um, in her judgment, particularly emphasised the position of the women and the voices of the women who had been involved um, in the in the um, exploitation that had occurred in that case. And then a third participant um, imagined a future. So she, rather than writing a, rewriting a judgment in the present, wrote a judgment for the future, imagining a future in which there had been um, a treaty between Indigenous people and um, settler colonialists in Australia um, mm -hmm. and in which Indigenous law was being um, re was reauthorised under that treaty. And so she was writing for the future of that position. So there were some interesting imaginative ways in which to, to engage with the with the position of um, Indigenous women within um, Australian law. And in the New Zealand project, that particular problematic um, about uh, the, the position of Indigenous people um, in the settler colonial legal system was taken a step further. So there was a, there was a group of Māori women um, who participated in the New Zealand project and what they basically did, they, and they, they, they operated separately, they were sort of a, a, a group within the larger group, um, and they collectively amongst themselves sort of developed a kind of Māori women's jurisprudence, an Indigenous women's jurisprudence, thinking about what would be the key jurisprudential concepts drawn from Māori um, concepts and worldview that might be um, relevant to determining legal decisions. And they then wrote their judgments from that perspective. And so in fact, the, the New Zealand project includes two kinds of judgments. So there's, there's feminist judgments, which were written by the, the white, the um, Pakiha participants, and what they called um, mana wahine judgments, which were written by the Maori participants. Um, Manawahine uh, roughly translates as the power or the authority of women um, within within Maori culture, and so they they very systematically developed a jurisprudence which they then drew upon in writing judgments um, for Maori women and about Maori women um, that that were then um, culturally appropriate rather than um, being subjected to the cultural norms of the, the white New Zealand um, legal system. Um, then moving on to the, the, um, the US project. So again, the, the US project, like the Canadian project, had its focus on the Supreme Court and a focus on constitutional cases um, in the Supreme Court. Um, but more broadly, and so there were a number of cases on uh, Bill of Rights, equality, due process, um, and, and but a range of other areas. But it was very much thinking about the way that the Supreme Court had um, developed its ideas about gender and, um, and gender issues and intervening at that level. But they have also then subsequently undertaken a number of projects on specific subject areas. So there are now um, uh, feminist judgment books in the US uh, dealing specifically with courts, with tax law, with property law, with um, reproductive justice, with employment discrimination, with trusts and estates, and with family law. So there's a sort of great blossoming of uh, um, feminist judgment books uh, in that context. In, but focused on specific 
subject areas. Um, the international law project, so feminist judgments in international law, uh, covers a range of international courts and tribunals. So it's not obviously confined to one jurisdiction, so it's another cross-jurisdictional project, if you like. Um, and one of the things that they did was to mirror the practices of international courts and tribunals um, by writing collectively. So many international courts and tribunals, and I, this is also the case in many civil law systems, um, produce a single judgment um, from the court, and so uh, which is the, the product of the, the collective thinking of the members of the court. And so what the International Judgments Project did was to um, require participants to negotiate amongst themselves and then produce a single judgment of their particular chamber. So a, a judgment of the um, uh, International Criminal Court or a judgment of the um, International Court of Judge Justice, a judgment of um, the European uh, Court of Human Rights as a single judgment in the way that that court would, would generally do. And so it was then necessary for the participants to um, to come to an agreement amongst themselves about what their feminist approach was going to be and how they were going to rewrite the case. And then they also included in the books their reflections on that process of negotiation and deciding how they were going to take, um, how they were going to tackle the issues and how that, what kind of a feminist approach they were going to take. Julie's also mentioned the, the Scottish project. Um, and, uh, and the, the close engagement with art practice as well as with law in that project. And in fact, as part of that project, as well as the book of feminist judgments, there is also an art exhibition. So artists were asked to respond artistically to um, some of the judgments that were also rewritten by the lawyers. Um, and there's a, a, a very nice article which looks at some of this artwork and thinks about the different ways that an artistic engagement with the issues in the case or with the people in the case um, differed from uh, a legal engagement with it, and, and which then really prompted reflection about what, you know, the, the, the possibilities but also the limits of a legal rewriting and the the kinds of things that you can say within that context, but also the kinds of things that can't be said by lawyers that could be said or could be expressed um, by artists, and particularly thinking about the sort of affective and emotional um, uh, responses to, to some of the, um, the issues raised. And then um, there are, as, again, as Julie mentioned, another, a number of other projects that are currently in progress. In fact, two separate projects in India, um, the African project, Pakistani project. There is now a feminist judgments project in Canada, which is adopting the, um, the, the methodology that we've all generally come to use and that Erica um, talked about rather than the, the Women's Court of Canada. There's a Central and Eastern European project. Um, the, a, a, there's somebody who's been working on a German project and has really, I think, grappled with the issue of um, the, or the, the different challenges of writing feminist judgments in a civil law jurisdiction where judgments might be very short, very conclusive and very much based on, you know, sort of derived from a, a codified law. Um, and I think that she has, has come to well, she's, she's making the argument that there, is, um, there will be circumstances where it's very difficult to produce a feminist account um, or to, to write a feminist, to do a feminist rewriting of the judgment, in which case she's suggesting that in those circumstances, it might make more sense to do a feminist rewriting of the code, of the statute, um, rather, because that would then enable 
um, more feminist decisions um, that are then decided under that statute. But there's also a project being done now focusing specifically on the International Criminal Court. And um, Erica and I have also had some conversation with someone who was um, wanting to set up a, a historical project, which is looking at um, feminist judgments across the British Empire um, in the, uh, it, it, as, a, as a historical um, phenomenon. So we're sort of eagerly awaiting uh, the outcomes of um, those projects and very pleased to be, uh, I suppose, adding the, uh, the Brazilian Feminist Judgments Project to that list. Now, there have also been um, a number of cases where people have written individual feminist judgments that are not part of a project but have been written by that person perhaps in some cases as part of a PhD thesis or as an exercise um, looking at a particular um, case that they wanted to rewrite. And I've given you references to some of these individual judgments um, on, the, on the, this slide and the next slide. All of them are available um, open access, so they're all published in open access journals. And so they should all be um, accessible to you. Uh, three of them concern Indian cases, um, uh, the cases around uh, rape, marital rape, around um, uh, recognition of um, same sex relationships, uh, and sort of decriminalization of um, same sex relationships. and. Um, a, a, a more historical case about um, consent and conjugal relations. So you can see there's a sort of theme there. Uh, and then uh, some of the European, case, European and, and Canadian cases. So uh, an English case, which again was about um, relationship recognition, uh, marriage and, and consent to sex. Uh, and, and then um, in terms of uh, abortion, um, the, the last one there looks at the, the European Court of Human Rights abortion, couple of abortion cases and rewrites them from um, a feminist perspective. And so then finally, what I'll throw out for you is in terms of the, you know, how to rewrite your feminist judgment. All of the projects that we have been talking about have adopted the approach of saying, right, we, we're going to rewrite this case from the very beginning. So the feminist judgment crafts a completely new judgment. Um, but there's an alternative methodology that's been used, particularly, or well, first of all, in this um, book, Diversity in European Human Rights, um, but that has been used in some of the other, some of the individual judgments as well, which is to um, take the original judgment and to edit it, so to make targeted changes to that original judgment um, in order to turn it into something that is more feminist. Uh, and I think the, certainly in the Diversity in European Human Rights book, their objective was to show the European Court of Human Rights how very easy it would be for them to make relatively small changes that would give more um, or fuller uh, recognition to the human rights of women and marginalised groups. And, uh, and so and because judgments of the European Court of Human Rights are very standardised, they're very formulaic, you know, they will start out with um, you know, recital of the facts, they will have the advocate general's opinion, they will then have the, you know, you only get to the actual substance of the decision towards the end. And so at that point, they would just add another paragraph or um, add some additional commentary, strike out perhaps a paragraph or substitute a different one, change, take out the word not <laughs> uh, in some cases. So, so if, I think it's, it's a methodology that, again, has its limits because it, you end up being very close to the original judgment and sometimes you want to completely escape from um, the constraints of the original judgment. But its advantage is that it does demonstrate, if you're trying to demonstrate to 
the courts that this is a very sort of plausible and possible way of doing things. It can show that with relatively small changes, um, a feminist approach might be possible. Um, to, to be fair, um, the, the, the Vanessa Avolio, the um, European abortion um, jurisprudence, individual uh, rewriting used that approach. But I, if you, I'm not sure whether it's something that would be too constraining for a sort of a thorough feminist rethinking um, about many cases, but nonetheless, it's there as an option for you to think about if it would work within the context of your particular um, jurisdiction. So uh, that's that's really all that I wanted to say, just to give you an idea of those sort of different possibilities, the, the different approaches that have been taken um, in other parts of the world, and very much looking forward to the discussion and to answering any questions that any of the participants might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Eu acho importante mencionar assim, o nível de entusiasmo que as intervenções de vocês estão recebendo no chat e pelas professoras que estão no projeto. São mais de 175 pessoas assistindo, o que é, não é usual nesses tempos em que já tem um desgaste, as ferramentas online e as divulgações são muitas pessoas. O nível de entusiasmo com a possibilidade de desenvolver esse projeto no Brasil é muito alta e nós não poderíamos estar mais gratas pela disposição, pela presença de vocês aqui e toda essa disponibilidade de partilhar conhecimento que vocês têm mostrado e todo mundo tem indicado um caminho muito grande de aprendizagem para desenvolver esse projeto no Brasil, e é muito bom saber que a gente conta com o um aconselhamento e a experiência de vocês. É importante mencionar que a Fabiana... <risos> so, she's... I, I was muted, I'm sorry, and she was saying that she's really happy because it has been a pleasure to hear you and to see your enthusiasm and to see your support and we have so many people watching us, that's so rare, uh, especially now that people are tired of online events and people are here to hear you and we're so happy to have you here. So we do have many challenges and you have pointed some of them. How to contextualize uh, it in the, in the moment that Brazilian history is uh, it, this super delicate moment and we understand that it's difficult, especially now, to talk about all this feminist agenda, but we do have a lot of space to explore. And we can talk about equality in Brazil. And we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but your enthusiasm shows us all the possibilities we have ahead. We couldn't be happier. So now Julia is gonna tell you about her questions. Now Julia is gonna talk to you. Hi, everybody. So I really want to thank you for the opportunity to hear you today. I'm so happy that you are, were available today to be here and that you could share your experience. Mas antes de fazer as perguntas do público, eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta minha. 
Primeiro, é, eu gostaria que as professoras... É, eu queria saber, na verdade, se tudo bem se eu fizer três perguntas e aí depois mais três, porque tem muitas perguntas aqui. So, there are too many questions. Bom, é, então, a primeira pergunta, então, vai no sentido de que... So, the first question is... the use of projects and the impact of the projects in legal education. I wanted to know more about how you use it at in the classroom and what could you uh, notice related to the students' uh, learning. The second question is from Carolina. So, how different theoretical approach and perspectives of uh, feminist fights are considered in the projects? And another question is from Danielle. Danielle. She wants to know about the reception of, of the projects by the... Um, the first level judges and the media. And she also wanted to know about uh, the representatives from... Yes. So Alida, can you help me with their answers? I just need to get some water. <laughs> so, Julie, Rosemary, and Erica, could you hear the questions? So there are three questions for you. If you want, I can repeat them. Julie says yes, right? So yeah, you can feel free to answer them. <laughs> okay. Right. So we've, got, we've got three questions, one on legal education, one on how different perspectives are dealt with in the projects, and one on the reception by judges. And the media, okay. yes. So I'm happy to deal with the second question. If one of you or both of you wants to do one of the others, maybe if we take one each, does that make sense? I'm happy I don't to mind, Erica. I'll kick off on use in the classroom and then maybe Julie you can yeah. you can add, yeah. add in because that was something I I brought I brought up. Um, so there's been a, a number of different ways they've been used in the classroom and there's various literature where people have written about how they've used um, the feminist judgments and um, sort of the different ways it's happened. My experience of using them was in a class where I was looking, it was a, a class on gender and law, and I gave the students the original judgment and the feminist judgment and asked them to consider them and to consider them as judgments. And what happened was that it was very useful in terms of, I got comments back like, the feminist judgment isn't as ranty as I thought it was going to be. So they, you, did, you were able to get through barriers of what the students thought feminism was going to be about. And actually what it then did was because of the judgment I gave them, the feminist judgment had far more law in than the judgment they were rewriting and the students were able to see and unpack the assumptions that the judge was making and the way in which he wasn't supporting his arguments through any legal um, precedent or, or conventions and was simply coming and asserting his decision. And that was a judgment that they'd already discussed in another seminar and I hadn't raised any of these points. And they were like, oh, very good judgment, interesting point. And then I gave them this and it helped them see 
that how judges write judgments is about a form of persuasion and the power of the of a judgment, the role of the judge, how it makes a difference, who the judge is, and so on. So it helped the students both see what femini feminist legal theory is about and the insights it could offer, but more importantly, it also helped them begin to challenge their assumptions they were making about real life judges and judgments and to see things in those judgments which they hadn't necessarily seen before because I gave them the same questions for both judgments and they were expecting to see certain things in the feminist judgments which they ended up seeing in the real judgments. So that was a way um, I I use them. Julie, you'll you'll have other examples of how you've how you've used them. Yeah, so thanks Erica. Um, I want to talk about two two techniques or two ways of bringing them to the classroom. So I often use the judgment that I rewrote and provide my own critical reflections on what I did or what I find difficult um, and maybe think about, speculate about how my judgment might be received um, from different feminist scholars or feminist theoretical frameworks. So kind of taking students through what you've done in a judgment uh, why it was difficult, why you were motivated to rewrite that particular case, they can find that learning about that process quite, quite interesting. Um, the other thing that we have done with the Northern Irish project is to run workshops for students where we talk about feminist judging, we do an introduction, uh, we talk about some of the cases that we've rewritten, but we take a recent case and ask the students to rewrite it. Um, and we've done that with both law students and non-law students, which in itself is quite interesting to see what the non-law students um, bring, bring to the table. Um, so the students are given the very tangible task of rewriting the, the judgment themselves. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think that the, those two points about helping the students to see the original judgment differently. So to see that the original judgment was not inevitable um, and is not objective, um, but is a product of a set of choices, deliberate choices that were made by the judge. That's really important. Um, and the other thing is that I, mean, I think a number of people have used the um, the project of rewriting a judgment as part of the assessment for students. So asking the students to write, rewrite a judgment, which helps them to really understand the way that a judgment is constructed um, because they have to, you know, they have to develop an understanding about the practice of writing a judgment um, and then, um, you know, getting them to rethink a particular case, either a set case or one that they have, have chosen. Um, so both of them have been quite successful as ways of, of um, using it with students. In relation to the question about how have different feminist perspectives been dealt with within the projects, this is, it, it's a good question. Um, and I, I have found this to be one of the kind of interesting and to me um, important aspects of the project as feminist methodology um, because it, when judgments, you know, somebody goes away, they write a draft judgment, there's then a workshop at which it's discussed and other people in the workshop might have a very different feminist approach to the particular issues. And so it means that we have those, we, we have those conversations um, in a context where it's not personal in the same way that some other feminist disagreements can be. And so we're arguing over different approaches to something else rather than thinking, you know, it being related to our identity, really, <laughs> and what our identity as a feminist might be. Um, and it's actually been very, 
a very positive process. So I think that the, the person writing the judgment gets to think about other possible ways of approaching it. And sometimes that has changed people's minds. And I've certainly had experiences of reading a draft judgment and thinking, oh, well, you know, you could push this a lot further or you're being you're still being very liberal, operating within a very liberal framework and making a set of liberal assumptions and perhaps you need to be not making those assumptions and thinking more deeply about um, a, a completely different theoretical approach. And sometimes the judgment writer has said, oh, yes, I never thought of that. You know, can, can let me read, give me some, give me a reading list um, and has gone away and rethought their judgment. And sometimes we've just had a disagreement. And, you know, some people say, well, I would say this. And some people say, well, I would say that. And, you know, th those disagreements can be aired, can be discussed, but ultimately, it's up to the person writing the judgment what they want to say in their judgment and you know that they've thought about other ways of doing it they've had other possibilities drawn to their attention and they've made an informed decision to take the approach that they have decided to take and so we've been very open um, about what you know different possibilities but we have also not been prescriptive um, in saying that you have to take this line or you have to take that line. Um, there are certainly judgments in, I think, all of the books that not all of the participants would agree with, um, but that's the nature of feminist judging, that if it was the real world, there would be different kinds of feminist judges. Um, they would make different kinds of decisions. I think that something that was really a key um, insight was, and that really we could see how it worked in practice, is that feminism is not monolithic, that there are many different feminisms and you would expect that to be reflected in your project and you would also expect it to be reflected in reality um, if, you know, if we got to the stage where there were lots of feminist judges. Rosemary? Isn't there one of the projects where, so what we, we did in our project, there was, there, was the, this was, there was one judgment writer and they wrote the judgment. Of course, another way you could do it on these cases is you just have two feminist judgments yeah. on a case. So yeah. that is one way in which you can start to explore the differences. And I, I can't remember, is there a project that's done that already, Rosemary, or is that a conversation? Uh, so the, in the New Zealand project, they were planning to do that. So they had two different people writing, rewriting the judgment about um, same-sex marriage. Um, so one of them was saying, yes, we should recognise same-sex marriage. This is an important social institution um, that should be equally available to same-sex couples as to heterosexual couples. And the other one was going to say, why on earth should we be perpetuating this awful patriarchal institution? Um, let's abolish marriage altogether. Um, but in the end, they didn't end up writing two judgments because the one who wanted, who was, had been planning to abolish the patriarchal institution actually decided that it was unethical to do that to the applicants in the case. So the applicants in the case clearly had an investment had come to the court seeking recognition of their relationship. And, and as, a, as a sort of ethical approach, it was not appropriate for the judge to play out their theoretical purity on the bodies and the lives of the litigants in front of them. Um, and so they ultimately decided that they couldn't do that. But it was then, I think they, they wrote it in the commentary that went with the judgment, and that's certainly the case in a number of the commentaries that can say the feminist judge has taken this approach, but there might be different feminist approaches that would do X, Y, Z. So I, I don't think there are any that have done the same case from different perspectives, but it's it's certainly possible. Um, and in fact, in the what, one very cool thing that they had in the New Zealand project was a judge rewriting his own decision 
So he had made a decision about it was a family law case in the 1970s and he thought he was being very progressive then and he could see now that he was not being very progressive at all. And so he wrote, re, re, he's now retired, but he rewrote his own decision um, from a, to make it more feminist. And then he brought along his draft and we all said, you think that's feminist? Let's tell you what's feminist. And then he, he redrafted it so it's much more feminist um, than it originally was. Yeah, I think the um, Scottish Feminist Judgments Project also had, as well as the kind of introductory commentary, they then had a reflection on the judgment, which can help make some of those um, feminist dilemmas visible, or maybe different appro theoretical approaches that the, the one particular judge was, was influenced by. So it's kind of what you can add to your judgment in terms of commentary, reflections, alternative judgments, and so forth? I mean, the, there are actually a number, a few projects, and there's something in Australia called the Critical Judgments Project, where they've taken the one case and rewritten it from a number of different theoretical perspectives, but they're not necessarily all feminist perspectives. So that, you know, we so say, how would this be done you know, from the point of view of a Dworkin liberal or a heart, you know, positivist or a, um, you know, a radical feminist or a postmodernist feminist or a critical race scholar. Um, but that exercise seems to me to be quite um, an arid one. Sorry, I can see we've lost Anna and I should wait until Anna comes back. Um, so that Maybe she wanted some water. Maybe I'll have some water while she's. I need to, to take out for a, a minute. Do you want to proceed with some questions? Do we do another round? And I can uh, ask sure. in English. Yeah. yeah. So Ian, oh, is she, is back. She. Yes, okay. É, Júlia, eu posso fazer essa, um apanhado aqui em, em inglês das perguntas e aí a gente faz mais uma rodada. Let's, let's do one more round of, of questions and, and answer. There is a lot of questions, but some questions about methodology. For example, how do you choose? How can we choose? How, what, what kind of criteria that... that have you used to, to choose the, the judgments to, to be rewritten? So this, this is one question. There is a question about uh, reception from the legal professions. How the, the judges react to, to this kind of, of proposal? They, they react well? Yeah, how, I'm, how, I'm sorry, how we, didn't, you... we didn't, yeah, we, we didn't answer that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if it, I, I remember was that that you had had mentioned the the idea of a workshop with judge so so yes. they, they can can be engaged on the approach maybe if you if you, you can comment on that and how how do you deal to access the the judgments for example if they they are, they are sealed if, if you have difficulties to access the, the judgments. How, how did you proceed about that? that there, are, there are this kind of, of methodological questions to, to build the project. I think if you can comment on that. But I'll, I'll just say quick, in relation to the question about the reception of the projects, by the legal profession. I think it has really varied between different countries. Um, so in some, so in England and Wales, they basically ignored it. Um, yeah, you know, it's irrelevant. Um, apart from some, you know, women judges organizations who have been quite interested. Um, in other jurisdictions, judges have been much more receptive and interested and have engaged more with the project and have 
um, change some, you know, visibly, demonstrably change some of the ways that they do things in response to um, the judgments. But it has, it's often depended on, you know, one individual judge here or there saying, that's interesting, it's made me think, um, rather than judges collectively or institutionally. Um, so that's that's something that we haven't yet quite we haven't quite broken through that barrier yet. I don't know, Julie, if you want to add anything on that about um, yeah, no, no. I think there have been different there. Yeah, so we we got a few judges um, who were very interested and very supportive. Um, in Northern Ireland at the time of our project, the first two women were appointed to the High Court. So they were quite interested. Um, there were a couple of quite um, progressive judges in Ireland and we, br we brought them together for a panel about, about their role, to talk about judgment writing, the role of the judiciary, how it was changing, um, what they thought about the methodology. And that was really refreshing because they were like, yes, why not? <laughs> you know, you, you, you can do this. You've set the rules for your project. Um, they were very, very open to it. Um, on the other hand, I do think we frightened some um, who seemed interested, but then kind of backed off a bit. Um, so that might, might be worth reflecting. What, what I did here, particularly in Northern Ireland, um, was that there was a lot of interest when our book was launched in judicial quarters. And at that point, the law librarian in the judicial chambers became our friend because we wanted to make sure there were copies of the book uh, for their reference. Uh, what, we, what we probably should have done was some kind of a more summarized, condensed leaflet um, or something about the project for those who did not have time to read a whole book um, or engage with it in that way. So that um, could be one way, but I think you will have um, allies who are interested in, in thinking about these kind of alternative ways of, of doing law. And it might be easier to get the less high profile judges involved because they may not feel as under as much heat in terms of political pressure. Um, that was our, conclusion as to why we couldn't get, for example, any of the Supreme Court um, judges in, in Ireland to, to support the project. Although that, of course, was different in England and Wales, where Brenda Hill was very supportive of it. So it depends. Yes. So so just to, to add, so obviously in Rosemary's right, our project, our project came at a different time. It came before social media. It became before people were were producing sort of various ways to to access academic material. We did have a strong ally in Lady Hale, who referred to the project a number of times. In when she was talking about it, she referred to the project um, when she was before the Const constitutional committee of our parliament, saying about how this is a project that demonstrates why judicial diversity is is important. So we we had we had her. Um, and one of the things I've noticed about our project is, and what's interesting is that sort of people haven't told us, they haven't engaged with us, but occasionally it kind of appears in something that somebody's written and you're like, oh my goodness, you, you read it. You've never, come, we never showed any interest in it, but it's kind of just out there. And I think it probably would be more out, it could be more out there in a, in a different time or if it was in a, a different format. But I wanted to say something about, because I think the question originally asked also about the media, and I think different projects will have had different um, engagement with the media, but we were able at the time of our project, when the book was published, excerpts of it was published in a national newspaper, the kind of flagship legal radio program did a little section on it. So there were people who were kind of curious and were interested in, in what we were saying. So it wasn't um, a complete sort of uh, blanket no. So I think the, I think 
there's lot there are would be additional avenues and more avenues today because even with our relatively low profile media wise we were able to make a, a few a few inroads on on that um can we, like we talk about, can we talk about the, the criteria for choosing? Yes, the methodology. Yeah, okay. yeah yes. all right. So, I mean, we've, it's interesting. So there's two different approaches that have been taken. So our view was that we should let the participants choose which case they want to write about because they are then invested in it. And they, people usually choose a case because it makes them angry um, or because they see it as a particular injustice and they want to correct that injustice. Um, the, the, and so we've sort of put out a call for expressions of interest and asked people to say what case they want to write about and why they want to write about it and what their feminist contribution is going to be. Now, what the... Um, the US project did instead was, and one of the Indian projects, I think, was to um, have a committee that identified what are the important cases that we want to have rewritten. And then they said, they asked for people to um, nominate to rewrite one of those already identified cases. Um, and and to say, you know, why they wanted to do it and what they would do with it. Now, it seems to me, and certainly this was borne out in practice, that the difficulty with that is that you've got your list of cases that you want rewritten and then somebody drops out or doesn't produce or, you know, is unable to actually get it done and then you've got a great gap in your, <laughs> in your list. Whereas if you don't have any sort of preconceptions about what you're trying to cover then, and, and people are more invested in what it is that they're writing, then they're more likely to stay with the project. Um, I mean, I think the other, the other difficulty with asking people, you know, choosing a list, having a list and then asking people to do which particular cases is that you, you choose someone and then they write something that is really weird or just very unfeminist or, you know, not just a particular version of feminism but actively not feminist um, or um, takes a very, um, you know, an implausible approach to the, to the decision and then you're stuck with it. Um, and I think that that's actually, in, in the American book, there are some decisions in there which... I think that they probably would rather not have published, but they were kind of in a position where they had to. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite an advocate of letting people choose their own cases, but there are arguments that go the other way. I think you can do that. You can kind of, I, I, I also like the people choosing their own cases approach, but that doesn't stop you having a wish list between you sort of by thinking like these are the ca cases that we think so that if someone if a couple of people identify the same case you've got sort of options that you can offer so there's a difference between publishing a list and having people sign up to it I I think that you but I still think you can give some thought to like what do we think the key cases are here so that you've kind of got a a sense and it's also so that you can have when you're talking to people about the project you, you've got the sort of oh we need someone to write this and you'd be really good at so you can you can do a hybrid um in the sense of but I think there was also something I liked about the call for expressions of interest which was that we weren't making assumptions about who would be interested and want to be involved in the project so we weren't going to people that we were thinking would be the expert to write on this case. We were just putting it out there and saying, come, can we can we kind of work see how we're going going to work together? And for me, that yeah. was and important part there's of also an issue about like what is susceptible to feminist rewriting. So people have come up with cases that it never would have occurred to me to put on a list. Um, you know, some of the environmental law cases, 
some of the, the contract cases and the commercial cases. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought of them, but they did, and they've come up with really interesting judgments. So I think you, you need to be open to that possibility as well. Does that answer that, that set of questions? Yes. So, yeah. so the, the other the other question was about accessing judgments. Ah uh, yes. How yeah. do access? Yes. So in lots of the projects we have focused on appeal level judgments. And in the common law system, they tend to be publicly reported. So we we did rewrite one um, trial level judgment, but again, it was it was publicly available, and we rewrote, rewrote a tribunal report, which was a different form of judgment, but it was again publicly available. So I'm not sure if Rosemary, perhaps you know of other projects where they wrote um, less publicly available judgments or I, I can't think of any. No, I mean, I think, I think people have generally gone from, you know, reported from cases that have been publicly reported. Um, and I did, yeah, and then I, I but it is a, a, a question about, you know, how does your jurisdiction work in terms of the publication of judgments and the, um, you know, what is in the public domain, what, how the system of precedent works or doesn't work um, you know, what is it important to, you know, are some judgments more powerful than, than others and therefore they might, might be the ones that you focus on. Um, but yeah, so it's been more of an issue, I think, in the projects where people have, where the judgment is in the public domain, but some of the arguments um, that, were, that people want to have access to, so they want to look at the case file um, to see what arguments were made or some of the factual information um, and that's not publicly available. Um, and some, I mean, I think in our project we said you can only work with publicly available material, but that includes, for example, newspaper reports of the case or, you know, whatever, whatever else might be open. But I know in some of the other um, uh, projects, people have gone and got hold of the case files um, where it was possible to do so and where they've got permission to do so and found some really interesting things um, about how the original judgment or the basis of the, about the evidence on which the original judgment was based and the evidence that was put to the court but not mentioned at all in the judgment, but if it had been mentioned, might have absolutely changed the outcome. Just, just to say, I... I understood the question differently. So I'm going to say my what well, I thought my answer to the question was, because I think it's like a comparison, because I thought you were asking about how the feminist judgments might be accessible, because that is something also that we were talking about. So I'm just raising that as something that has been considered and been thought about. Like we have been producing these judgments that we hope are going to have an impact on how people think, and then they're included in a book that people have to buy and to, in order for them to be able to read it. And so um, like, I think there is also something to be thinking about in terms of where the final project product goes. Is, is it a book? And if it is a book, are there other ways in which the judgments can be accessible, whether it's shorter summaries or some of the things that the Scottish Feminist Judgment Project has done around um, the sort of the their art exhibition and and so on and I know that later projects and and the, the Northern Irish project was really great at this has, has been used has had a much more open access interface than than we did just because the time time has moved on but I really think it's something to think about like as we to, that goes ha hand in hand with the argument that these judgments make a difference is they need to be in a form that enables that to happen most effectively and whether that's a, a published collection or in some other form. So I, I was adding that because that's what I thought you were asking. So if you weren't asking that, that's just a little extra. É, bom, é, a gente está encaminhando para o final agora, mas antes é, das professoras se despedirem, da professora Fabiana 
falar uma última palavra. É, tem uma última só, uma questão, que é da Ana Cláudia Varranha, se somente os casos judiciais eles são possíveis de reescrita ou reinterpretação, porque é, tem alguns casos, né, de alguns... What they want to know now, that's the last question, is if only judgments are rewritten. So that's the last question, and then after that, we can say our goodbyes. Okay. <laughs> so after that, uh, Fabiana is going to say some other words and then we can come back and say our goodbyes. Could you understand okay. the question? Can you clarify the question? Is it, is it yes. So if only judgments were the parts that were rewritten or maybe other parts of uh, the case or maybe other things, legal, uh, other legal documents were rewritten too. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so mainly it's been judgment. Um, I think Julie mentioned that it, they, they did a um, rewriting of the, the report of the Tribunal of Inquiry, which is something slightly different. Yeah, um, it's a public inquiry. There have been uh, different kinds of judgments. So in, in the sort of Anglo-Australian system in a criminal case you will have it if it's the case has been decided by the conviction the guilt has been decided by the jury but then the judge gives the sentence says what you know how long they will spend in prison or what fine they will have or whatever and so there's been rewriting of sentencing decisions which, um, which are not judgments about whether the crime was committed, but judgments about what follows from what the consequences will be for the for the offender. Um, yeah, yes, I mean that's that's been my case, but that's also because in our sort of common law systems, the judgment is the thing, you know, the judgment is the key thing. Um, it's the it's the center of attention. And so That's what we have rewritten. But if in your system there are other key documents, like you know, the argument in the European context, the argument made by the advocate general, or the argument made by the prosecutor, or um, you know, other aspects that are central, then I think that there's no reason why you can't think about rewriting them instead. I mean, certainly. I was involved in a in a live project um, with a women's rights organization in Afghanistan, and they were they rewrote or they recast um, defence arguments in favour of women who had been sent to jail for adultery. Um, so they weren't obviously in control of the judgments, but they were in control of the arguments that were put through the court to argue why these women should be released from prison. Um, and so they used the feminist judgment methodology, but what they rewrote or what they rethought was the kind of argument that you might put to the court to, um, to say why they should not be convicted or why they should not be in prison. So, yeah, it's, it's open. And there are examples of other projects where that have rewritten statutes as, as yes, well. Yeah, so, yeah. so there are they're not part of the sort of feminist judgments project family so much, but they're I don't know what they 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 they're related to that. So I think Rosemary mentioned I think it's in Germany where they're they're thinking about doing a, a hybrid, but there's also clear examples where groups of feminist scholars have got together and rewritten the legislation. And, and that's the sort of the, the, the that's the um, source that they've been wanting to um, to engage with. So they're, they're for my views, there's no reason why the feminist judgments needs to just be judgments. There are examples of um, it, the guiding principle of putting feminist scholarship into action and into practice is, is being played out in, in a number of different um, areas.
Bom, é, quero agradecer imensamente. I want to thank you. Uh, thanks for accepting, thanks for participating today. I think it's... I've been following YouTube and our conversation here. And people are so enthusiastic about it. They have so many ideas. People are discussing a lot of things based on your, based on your speech. We really want to continue that dialogue with you. It has been so rich that you could, you know, meet the other professors that are working with us and other scholars that are working with us. So we're beginning, and tomorrow we do have another uh, another day in this event, and some of us are gonna uh, explain why we were uh, discussing that right now in this. Brazilian moment. <laughs> we understand that what we have that is powerful is reimagine our experiences and our legislation based on different approaches, uh, feminist approaches. Maybe find us new horizons based in what we have been facing in Brazil nowadays. I really want to thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. I think we've really enjoyed and the conversation and would love to continue to, um, to engage with you and to answer any further questions and to see how the project develops. Particular thanks to Anna for her wonderful translation work. Um, but thank you also to Fabiana and Julia Elida um, for facilitating the session and yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed it and hope that there will be more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.